Hello, Internets. One of the most ridiculously common misconceptions against libertarians, or sometimes just fiscal conservatives in general, is the false claim that we just want the poor to die. That we just want to completely strip the social safety net from under the less fortunate and have the working poor processed into biomatter or something when they are no longer useful. You may see many people on the socialist side of things saying things like this all the time. This straw man argument is often followed up with the claim that you need a strong government safety net, usually backed by higher taxes of course, or else there will be extreme poverty and death and doom and rioting in the streets and lots of bad stuff and bad things etc etc etc. In this video, I'm going to explain why this is simply not true. Why society actually can provide people with a decent social safety net from private sources, and why government intervention is actually a big reason why current private charity systems are not as prevalent as they could be. This is an important subject to tackle because I've noticed that even a lot of people on the right side of the political spectrum often fall from this misconception, that a strong state is needed to redistribute wealth, when in reality, humanity is quite resourceful and finds ways to be altruistic and helpful to one another without the state. As evidence, by the simple fact that we actually did so in the past. No, really, we did. True private welfare has in fact been tried. And to truly understand this concept, we must go back in time to the late 19th and early 20th centuries, where we reached the primary focus of this video, the tale of fraternal societies. I should first note that a lot of this information is going to come sourced from the book From Mutual Aid to the Welfare State by David T. Beto. It's a really good book, and credit must be given where it is due, as a portion of what I'm about to say is a highly abridged and editorialized take for the sake of comprehension. So if anyone is curious about this subject in greater detail, feel free to give this book a read, especially since it contains an extremely well done compilation of sources on a topic that has been largely memory holed and completely ignored by modern historians. So anyway, when it comes to fraternal societies, we actually had a pretty effective private welfare system of the past. One that was extremely popular, with an estimated 1 in 3 men during the 1920s being a part of them. This is important to emphasize because back in the 19th and early 20th century, the United States government had a much smaller economic footprint and social welfare programs were significantly less prominent, with things being arguably more minarchist, or as many people might say, classically liberal. And because this was during the pre-modern era of industrialization, much of the world was still in poverty, and yet people still managed to get by. Fraternal societies were a big part of this and why people managed to still make ends meet, creating a system of mutual aid and community belonging during relatively difficult times. Back before the modern era where we have all this technology to give us much larger quality of life. Anyways, the basic explanation of a fraternal benefit society is a private and voluntary lodge-based democratic organization that provided certain mutual aid benefits to its members and their families when they were struck by various life hurdles. They offered many benefits that mirrored much of what the public safety net of today offers, but the most important benefits were cash payments as a result of not being able to work, unemployment benefits, building homes and businesses, medical care through a lodge system, sick pay, helping members in their old age, scholarships and orphanages. Millions of Americans during this time frame of the 1800s to early 1900s were part of these societies and received many different mutual aid benefits from them. And again, it was all coming from the private sector. In this light, you can sort of think of them as prototype insurance agencies that were often run for reasons other than just profit. There was much more to it than that. They usually had some kind of common ground that tied the members together. For instance, there were some female-only lodges, but they still called themselves fraternal. This happened because a big part of fraternal societies was freedom of association. So there were hundreds of these societies and they were often very picky with their members, with many of them possessing rituals and behavioral requirements to join, and often had behavioral requirements to maintain membership as well. This was actually largely seen as a good thing that went hand in hand with the freedom of association that these societies followed. Joining a lodge usually meant adopting a set of shared values and virtues that the lodge practiced. Many lodges put a focus on encouraging their members to adopt socially sustainable moral principles, just as encouraging self-control, self-governance, self-reliance, responsibility, good moral character, leadership and often tied together through the promotion of mutualism, which in this sense meant a cooperative society where all parties mutually benefited from each other's contributions to the lodge. Having a set of virtues promoting strong character was generally very important to these societies, and you could even be banned for what was deemed amoral or otherwise unethical behavior alone. This was also seen as a good thing and an incentive to join as it meant belonging to a society filled with upstanding citizens rather than just random street hoodlums or violent gangs. Needless to say, fraternal societies obviously provided a strong sense 
sense of community, providing another incentive to join even if you didn't really need the help. And lodge meetings were generally seen as an enjoyable experience that often included entertainment and fellowship. Because of this, a lot of them had religious or ethnic requirements. While that may seem like discrimination at first glance, there were so many different fraternal societies to choose from that people could generally always find a society that welcomed them regardless that gave a sense of communal belonging. Now, when it comes to relief, there was also two different types of relief that these societies offered to their members, hierarchical relief and reciprocal relief. Hierarchical relief was largely bureaucratic in nature, handled by large institutions, where the relief to members usually would come from the donations of people from a significantly different background or economic class, you could say. Reciprocal relief, however, was far more popular. This was relief that would generally come from within the local community and usually from those in the same status as yourself. A person benefiting one day could be the donor of tomorrow. This fosters a sort of you help other members of the community when they are down and we will help you when you are down, kind of an all-for-one, one-for-all system of community and camaraderie. All achieved, again, under private ownership in the midst of a free market economy, with minimal government overhead. As opposed to some communist state, like some people might tell you is needed to achieve achieve this level of communal aid and cooperation. When it comes to health benefits, fraternal societies had a particularly ingenious system of providing medical care at a very low cost, making it affordable to the working class poor of the time. This was known as medical lodge practice. Rather than paying a large sum to see a standard medical practitioner, what fraternal societies would do in order to provide medical care to their members would be to hire doctors at an annual salary rate who would then provide care to said members in their local lodge as needed. Lodge practice allowed fraternal societies to, in a sense, split the medical costs between each other by each paying an annual membership fee, and only using the doctor's services as needed. Which again, because most fraternal societies promoted ideals of mutualism and responsibility, members had an incentive not to abuse said system. The result of this that an entire year's worth of medical care could be paid for by a day or two's worth of the average man's earnings for the time. Today, this would be the equivalent of a medical insurance plan that only costed you less than $15 a month, something just about anyone could afford. Now at this point you may be thinking of societies like the Freemasons, or the IOSH, International Order of St. Hubertus, with all their secrecy and strange rituals and silly hats of course, funny robes, and associated conspiracy theories. They may or may not control the world as a shadow government, or perhaps they just want you to think that they secretly control the world because it makes them look cooler. This would only be partially correct. The fraternal societies of the past weren't all so secretive. There were actually three main types of these lodges dominating the market around the end of the 19th century. First would be secret societies, such as the Masons. Second would be sick funeral and other mutual benefit societies. And finally, third would be societies focusing on life insurance. However, there was a lot of overlap here. For instance, a fraternal society, if they chose to do so, could be all three of these, being a secret society that offered all kinds of mutual aid and community while still being secret. But they didn't have to if they didn't want to. I could go into more detail, but probably the best and more interesting way to explain how all this actually operated is to provide some solid examples. So in the next section of the video, let's look at a few of these societies of the past and see just what they did and how they operated. I'll first start with the Loyal Order of Moose. This is a fraternal society that actually still exists today despite no longer being as important as they once were during the early 1900s, with membership dropping since the 1970s. Originally founded as a men's club, it was repurposed into the Society of General Mutual Aid by James J. Davis, the order's general director who envisioned the order as a society providing a simple social safety net with a variety of health and communal benefits to the members, for the working class at a low-cost annual membership fee of about $10. Most notably was Mooseheart, the orphanage and school that the Loyal Order of the Moose operated. For instance, if a child's father was a member and he tragically passed away somehow, the order would then take the child in and raise them. And children raised by Mooseheart actually did quite well for themselves as adults, earning significantly higher weekly wages than average. Next I'll mention the Ladies of the Maccabees. Founded in 1892 as a female subset of the Knights of the Maccabees Fraternal Society, the LOTM was an example of a life insurance based society that also offered business training skills on the side to young women. They eventually split from the Knights and changed their name to Women's Benefit Association and offered different benefits. This was an example of exclusivity and freedom of association in practice, as the society banned men from membership. Not too surprising considering the name Women's Benefit Association. Although they tried to avoid politics, being a ladies club, they also did focus a little bit on women's rights and partook in early versions of feminism that focused on equality of standing as opposed to, you know, before feminism was taken over by the equity fallacy and equality of outcome. All in all, this society did okay for themselves. 
Another niche exclusive society was the United Order of True Reformers. This was actually an all-black fraternal society during the late 1800s post-slavery that enjoyed some moderate success under its founder William Washington Brown. Aside from just being a mutual aid society for helping African Americans get on their feet, it's worthy of note for also focusing on business. Brown used this mutual aid network as a way to help black-owned businesses flourish in a time of post-slavery. Being a former slave himself, he likely understood the unique challenges faced during this time. This fraternal society helped run a bank, hotel, various retail stores, and even a newspaper called The Reformer. In terms of ethics, Brown wanted to instill the art of frugalism into the African American community, an economic principle of spending cheaply and managing money responsibly under the slogan, Save the cents, and the dollars will take care of themselves. Unfortunately, after Brown's death, the society kinda lost sight of his financial strategy and fell under due to defaulting on loans. One last example, the SBA, or the Security Benefit Association. The SBA is a good example of a fraternal society that had a goal of being everything except a secret society, in that they wanted to provide a wide variety of benefits to their members, or as they called it, protection now furnished from cradle to the grave. Founded in 1892, they focused a lot on the construction of useful ventures to provide care. This included an orphanage for children, building homes and a hospital for families for everyone else, and an old folks home for the elderly, hence the slogan, cradle to the grave. The SBA did, however, run into some issue. There was a Kansas law that prohibited fraternal societies from owning these things, so the SBA had to create a separate association to officially own their hospitals and homes. This wasn't really a big deal for them at the time, but it did foretell the problems that these societies would start to run into around the early to mid-1900s. And that brings us to our next section, which starts with a simple question. If fraternal benefit societies were so common and flourished as an effective system of private social welfare, why did they fall out of style? Well, to start, the lodge system providing medical care came under attack because it was seen as providing medical care for too little of a cost. This created some butthurt amongst the standard non-lodge practice hospitals because they were having trouble competing with the low prices and saw the lodge system as a form of class insubordination and unfair practice. Basically, they didn't like the fact that patients were controlling doctors through the lodge system rather than the other way around and started tossing baseless accusations against doctors who accepted lodge contracts. In other words, it was a medical cost crisis crisis, but not the crisis we have today where medical insurance and costs are too expensive. This was the opposite. This was a crisis among the elite because the costs were too cheap, due to competition being too great. So what did they do? Well, their response can be seen reflected in the Pennsylvania Medical Journal in 1904, demanding that the club doctor must be shut out of the profession, and many medical professionals begin to accuse the lodge doctors of being quacks, claiming that their services must be inadequate, low quality and care somehow, and therefore they must be banned. So starting around the 1920s, lodge practice faced the problem of regulation. State medical societies started lobbying the state to impose sanctions against any doctor who would accept lodge contracts. They also recommended that physicians who dared to offend them be barred from membership of official medical practitioners. So it was not the people who were paying for membership to fraternal societies offering a lodge practice who freely decided that they no longer wanted lodge doctors. It was government regulation attacking the practice based on misguided principles that ultimately killed the lodge doctor. This is all covered quite extensively in Chapter 6 and how medical practice through lodges was unfairly demonized and came under numerous propaganda attacks from medicalist institutions who were simply afraid of the steep competition. With lodge practice dying out for medical care, fraternal societies now had less to offer and unfortunately their problems did not end there. A combination of regulations dubbed the Force Bill and the Mobile Law added additional problems for them that made it harder for fraternal societies to make ends meet. The Mobile Law defined what a fraternal society was, which limited their scope and added certain requirements to maintain tax exemption status that not all societies could keep up with. The Force Bill was a series of regulations that included provision that a fraternal societies needed to charge a minimal rate to, again, maintain their status, with the excuse given that it was to supposedly prevent unfair competition. With fraternal societies, Hamstrung eventually reached a new deal in the early mid-1900s, which had the government offering many of the social programs that fraternal societies were having a difficult time providing anymore, and thus the government came in to provide a solution to a problem that was arguably mostly the government's fault. Truly, our heroes. From then on, fraternal societies slowly started to putter out. They aren't completely gone, some still exist today, especially the more secret and exclusionary societies that have alternative goals than simply providing mutual aid. But it pales in comparison to the vast network of societies that people in the US once had to choose from. 
This all provides an important economic lesson to be learned for society as a whole. Be careful what you wish for when it comes to asking the government to come in and regulate a sector of the economy. Many of the regulations that were levied against fraternal benefit societies may, on an individual basis, seem reasonable. For instance, barring lodge doctors was of course framed in the context that it would improve medical care overall, and a law requiring them to be non-profit may also seem relatively innocent at first. But the problem with state regulation is that it all too often creates unforeseen and unintended consequences. If we were able to actually go back in time and prove to our great 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 grandparents that lobbying the state to regulate their competitors would eventually lead to the collective doom for most of their paternal societies, I imagine many of them would have a very different stance on support for said regulations. So let's now come back to the present day and go over how all this ties into modern private charity. Due to differences in culture and technology, it would be very difficult and very strange to perfectly recreate the fraternal societies of the past today, and thus a much more modern equivalent would have to fit in with the how private charity currently operates. I imagine such a system would be a fusion of current organizations and the mutualist nature of fraternal society, leading to a combination of both reciprocal and hierarchical aid rather than just focusing on reciprocal aid alone. Now at this point, some people might be asking the questions, why even bother with privatizing the social safety net at all? Doesn't the government already provide decent enough benefits? If the state can do it, then why risk privatization? We have programs like SNAP, state unemployment benefits, free Medicaid for the poor, TANF, etc, etc. And these programs do provide some relief to families and individuals who qualify at least. So what's wrong with it? Well, it comes down to three issues. Efficiency, incentives, and of course, taxation. First, there is of course the problem of taxation. Government programs are not free, but are instead a system that we are all forced into paying for every time you get your paycheck. This problem should seem obvious, but alas, many people still try to argue that public assistance is free. It's not free. We have to pay for it, and we do pay for it, whether we like it or not. Second, government programs are not efficient compared to private charity. This is not a right-wing talking point, it is a proven fact. In a study cited by the Advocates for Self-Governance and published on the Mises Institute titled The Cost of Public Income Redistribution and Private Charity, they found that most of the resources for state public programs goes to actually maintaining the bureaucracy of that public program at a 70-30 split, while the opposite is true for private charity organizations where the majority of the money actually goes towards the beneficiaries. So not only do you have to pay your taxes toward these programs, programs, but the majority of your money doesn't even go towards helping the poor. There are also various problems with each of the government programs I just mentioned that could easily stretch into their own video. But to make a long story short, Medicaid does not solve the problem of high medical costs, it just socializes those costs. TANF and SNAP are easily abused and not as efficient as they could be, and anyone who has ever had to contact their state unemployment office knows that the customer service they provide pales in comparison to even some of the worst private insurance agencies. And not to mention the biggest problem with state public assistance of all. Many of them come with strict income ceilings, where if you make more than the limit, you suddenly become ineligible. This can incentivize families who are close to said threshold to intentionally stay poor. For instance, pretend you are in the working class and making $10 an hour, and this qualifies you for a state benefit that would provide you with value that is equivalent to if you were making $15 an hour but you would no longer qualify if you made any more money, so your company offers you an opportunity for promotion to shift leader for $13 an hour. This would theoretically place you in a position where accepting this promotion actually results in a net loss for you. It sounds crazy, but unfortunately this is an actual thing that happens. It is a scourge known as the welfare trap, a documented and well-proven economic issue where there is a financial pitfall in the amount you would have to earn to earn the same on welfare and your gross income. For the fraternal benefit societies of the past, the exact opposite of this was true. Becoming better off would only award people with greater standing and respect in their mutual aid community. No such trap existed in any meaningful capacity. Fraternal societies had a strong incentive to lift their members out of poverty, as the more members doing well meant greater opportunities for their community as a whole. But with the state, the government has no incentive at all to fix the welfare trap. The state's incentive lies not with mutual success, but with them of course staying in power. And the more people they can make dependent on the state, the more support they can grift in order to retain that power. In conclusion, people who want a better support system for the working poor, such as the social democratics, are not wrong that we could do more to help the poor and provide better economic mobility. They are just wrong that it needs to come from a strong state. As it turns out, humans for the most part do not want to let each other die in the streets, and we are perfectly capable of finding ways to help each other without being threatened to do so. Anyways, that's all for now. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, feel free to like, subscribe, tip, or whatever. Oh, and you can follow me on Twitter now if you want, since I decided to actually use the platform as of April 25th. So, till next time.